A Call to the Ministry by Douglas Hammett. Chapter 1. Four Scriptures. A call to preach is not just a call to preach. It is also a call to minister. Therefore, there is more involved in a call to preach than just standing in a pulpit and speaking. There are several things we need to look at concerning a call. We will look at four scriptures first to get a background. Then, we will look at some wrong reasons people think they are called into the ministry. Last, we will look at the necessary ingredients of a call. 2 Timothy 2.2 2. The things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, who shall be able to teach others also. This charge to commit teaching to faithful men was given by Paul to Timothy. Timothy, the pastor of the church, was in the process of turning the church that he and Paul had started over to another pastor. Paul instructed him that he was to look for a certain type of man, faithful men. Therefore, we see that there is a matter of church responsibility concerning a call to the ministry. There are two things here that the church is responsible for. First, they are to judge in the matter of character of a man. If a man is going to be in the ministry, he has got to have more than just a speaking ability. He also has to have a godly character. His life is important because he has a ministry to fulfill. Then, second of all, he has to be one that is able to teach others. In other words, with the call comes the ability to teach. Let's consider the character issue first. If you have been called into the ministry, people ought to be able to look at you and say, there is a faithful man. If they ask you to do something, they can depend on you to do it and not back out on them. You should be known as one who pays his bills. If you are not good for your debts and your bills, then you don't deserve to be in the ministry. A lot of preachers have ruined the name of preachers and Christianity because they were not faithful men in their lives. The second area is the ability to teach. There are a lot of men in the ministry that are not able to speak or teach in a way to reach people's hearts. They seem to be completely absent of any mental power at all and are unable to get across the simplest truths in God's word. Those men do not have any business being in the ministry. These two areas need to be under the judgment of the church as well as the individual. Sadly, the area of the church's responsibility is often overlooked. Most men think, God has called me to preach, so it doesn't matter what my church thinks. That is not true. The church also needs to give its stamp of approval on a young man. If the church says, young man, we do not feel like you are called. We do not feel like you ought to be in the ministry. Then that man ought to take a second look. He better think very long and hard before he tries to enter the ministry against his church's judgment. I'm not saying that a church is never wrong, but generally a church is more lenient rather than being too strict in this matter of allowing a man into the ministry. <laughs> Romans 12, 1 through 3. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God had dealt every man the measure of faith. We see in these verses that a Christian ought to be willing to yield his body to Christ as a sacrifice, totally and completely. He should not be conformed to the world, but should transform his mind and find out what the will of God is. Then in verse 3, we find the individual's responsibility to think right about himself. This involves having a right assessment of his gifts and abilities and to consider them honestly, not with an inflated view of self, but with an honest view. Any young man who feels that God is calling them into the ministry should soberly, honestly look at himself and ask, am I called or am I not? Am I the kind of man that ought to be in the ministry or am I not? You have the responsibility to assess your own gifts. The church can look on your outward life, but only you can look on the inward life. Unless you are honest with yourself, you will delude yourself many times into thinking things that are not so. 1 Timothy 3.1 This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. Some ask, where does ambition fit in? Here we find that there is such a thing as desiring to preach. Some men have the idea that you should not desire to preach. They think God should just somehow zap you and you should start preaching. That is not true. There ought to be a desire there to preach. But just having desire to preach is not a call from God. You must look at the source of that ambition. 
There is a godly ambition, and then there is a selfish, ungodly ambition or desire to preach. You need to assess yourself and find out what kind of desire or ambition you have. James 3, 1. My brethren, be not many bastards, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. A man who feels he is called to preach needs to seriously consider this verse. If you become a pastor, you will have a responsibility for those in your flock. You are going to give answer for all those people, and you are going to give an answer for your ministry. You are going to have many responsibilities that you would not have as a layman. As a pastor, you have taken on a responsibility, and you cannot hold up under that responsibility unless God holds you up. So you need to stop and think soberly and honestly. You need to look at yourself and your ambition and the responsibility that is laid upon you when you receive the call to preach. When you get that call and accept it, you are accepting not only the privilege of standing and preaching to the people, but at the same time you are accepting the responsibility of answering to God for all that you do. A preacher walks a different line than the layman in the pew. You will find this out quickly. You are going to have to live a different life than the people in the church do. There are going to be things that people in your church can do rightly that you cannot do. There are going to be some things that they can say that you cannot say. There are going to be some times that you want to go do something, but you cannot do it because you have some responsibility to fulfill. As a pastor, you are not going to have time to do all the golfing and fishing and all the rest of that like you used to do. You are going to have to cut back on some things you may like to do. The preachers that don't curtail these things are not fulfilling their responsibility. You can get too busy with golfing, too busy with fishing, too busy with recreation. Yes, you need some recreation from time to time, but you can get too carried away. You need to seriously consider yourself and watch this responsibility. You have a job to do, and usually there aren't enough hours in a day to do it. Chapter 2. Six Wrong Reasons There are many wrong reasons why a man may think he is called to preach. We will not be able to cover all of them, but want to look at the six main ones. A wrong understanding of your own gifts and graces. This is basically what we look at in Romans 12.3. A man needs to soberly assess himself and find where he stands with God. For instance, you have all been blessed with knowing that person that feels like God has given them a beautiful voice and they're going to sing and bless the congregation. However, you can't wait for them to get done because they sound horrible. They have not honestly looked at their singing ability. I enjoy singing, but I don't punish the congregation with my singing very often. That is not my gift, and I know it. We need to look at ourselves honestly. A lot of men do not look at themselves honestly, and this is where one of the major problems come. They think they are called to preach, and they think they have the ability to teach, but they have not honestly looked at themselves. They have a wrong conception, a wrong assessment of themselves. Sometimes this comes from pride. They do not want to honestly look at themselves. They may think, I'm too good to make a mistake or have anything wrong with me. I'm too spiritual to make a wrong choice or decision. Pride will often make a person arrive at a wrong understanding. That pride has to be broken down in a person's life before they will ever be used of God in a preaching ministry. The matter of pride can destroy you quickly. You will wonder why someone else got the honor instead of you. Why they got to preach and you didn't. Why someone else got the glory and you did not. If you don't deal with pride, it will eat you up. It will keep you from looking at yourself honestly and seeing exactly where you stand. A lot of men think they are called to preach and they are God's gift to the congregation. The only problem is there isn't any congregation that feels like they are God's gift to them. The congregation doesn't want anything to do with them. There is something wrong with a man like that. A lot of times, it is a matter of pride getting a hold of him. Sincerity will make it many times keep a man from rightly assessing himself. There are some men, believe it or not, who are in the ministry for the wrong reasons. They want to make money, and they are not sincere about the ministry. They are not sincere, and they are not honest with themselves. The question you need to honestly ask yourself is, why do I want to preach? Do I want to preach so that I can make money? Do I want to preach so I can have an easy job? Do I want to preach because I love the attention of others? If so, you are in the wrong profession. It is not easy to pastor a church. There is more work involved in the ministry than most people will ever see. Until you get into a church and you have more work than you can get done, you will not understand the work involved or what it is like to be busy. 
You think you are busy in school. Hmm, just wait until you start pastoring. You need to be sincere and honest in evaluating why you want to preach. Sometimes men are unwilling to listen to their brethren. When I was younger, I knew a man who thought he was called to preach. For over 20 years, he persisted in proclaiming his call, yet no one wanted to listen to him. If he was going to speak in church, most of the crowd would stay home so they wouldn't have to listen to him. When he would try to preach, he would just ramble and go in circles, and he couldn't get any point across. His own wife could not understand him and was embarrassed for him. Yet he persisted in thinking he was called to preach. He would not listen when anyone tried to tell him that maybe he was mistaken. Many people tried to counsel him against the call to the ministry, but he was convinced that God had called him to preach. No one could change his mind. There is something wrong with a man like that. He has made a wrong assessment of his gifts. He may be a fine man, but he is not the kind of man to stand behind a pulpit if God has not given him the ability to teach and preach. He needs to be honest and give up that desire. There is no evidence of a call in his life. Sometimes men will think they are called to preach, but they had a desire to edify themselves instead of others. However, the Bible teaches that the gift of preaching is to edify or to build up the church, not to build up the preacher. I may enjoy preaching a message, but just because I may enjoy it does not mean that my people got anything out of it. Most of the time, if I enjoyed the message, the people got something out of it too. But that is not always true. I know preachers who enjoy preaching, but nobody ever gets anything out of it. Just because you enjoy standing in front of people and speaking is a wrong reason to go into ministry. It is a wrong assessment, a wrong understanding of your gifts and graces. You need to honestly look at yourself. An unholy desire for the authority and attention connected with the ministry. Then Jesus spake to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore whatsoever ye bid you observe, that observe and do. But do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. For they bid bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne, and lay them on men's shoulders. But they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. But all their works they do for to be seen of men. They make broad their phylacteries, and enlarge the borders of their garments, and love the uppermost rooms at the feasts, and the chief seats in the synagogues, and greetings in the markets, and to be called of men, Rabbi, Rabbi. Matthew 23, 1-7. The scribes and Pharisees had an unholy desire for the authority and attention connected with their office. In fact, Jesus said that they did all their work simply to be seen of men. They loved the attention they received from the crowds. They loved to walk around in the crowd and have people notice them and call them rabbi. Jesus warned the people not to be like them. The preacher has a lot of authority. He is not just an everyday person. When a preacher makes a comment about something, his people usually listen to what he has to say. They may not always agree with him, but at least they feel it is important enough to listen to. The young man sits in the pew, and he sees all that and thinks, My, I would like to have that much power and authority. I wish people would listen to me. An unholy desire for the authority and the attention that is connected with the ministry will often drive a man into the ministry. He says, Well, I want to be noticed around the church. I don't just want to take up the offering. I don't want to just sweep the carpet. I want to be somebody important. I want to be in the limelight. I want to be noticed by everyone. Most church splits are because of that reason. Someone wants to be noticed. Someone wants more of the glory. He doesn't want the preacher to be in the limelight. He wants to be there. He wants all the attention on himself. Most preachers have to fight this problem of being in their limelight. I don't know of any preacher that can sit in another church or congregation without having to fight that desire to be in the pulpit. As a preacher, he should have the desire to preach. He should feel, I wish I was preaching. I have a message. I wish I could give it to the people. But he needs to soberly assess his reason. Why does he want to be up there? Is it because God has laid a message on his heart and wants to deliver that message to the people? Or is it because he wants the attention? He wants it to be in the limelight. If that is the reason, it is the wrong reason to be in the ministry. Every preacher ought to desire to be in the pulpit so he can deliver God's message. But no preacher ought to desire the authority as far as wanting to run the show, to be in the limelight, the attention-getting spot. A lot of preachers end up that way. They start out right, but before long, they get their priorities mixed up, and then all they want is the attention. If God has called you, the reason you want to preach ought not to be that you want the attention or you want to be the one in charge. That is a wrong reason to be in the ministry. Yet there are countless men in ministry for that very reason, and they have not been honest enough to take a good look at themselves. A wrong concept of spirituality. 
One time I heard a man say, I believe the most spiritual person in the church ought to be the pastor. That is not always the case. They're thinking wrong. They think, in order to be the pastor, I have got to be the most spiritual man in the church. But there will be times when others in your church are more spiritual than you are. I am talking here about maturity in the Christian faith. There are some of you here that are not as mature as the people you will end up pastoring. You are going to have some people that are more mature in faith than you, and from time to time, as you grow and spend more time and study and walk with God, eventually you will be more mature spiritually than the other people in the church, especially as you get older. As you are young in the ministry, there are going to be some in your church that are more mature than you, but God has still called you to be their pastor. That is why you are there. You aren't there because you are more spiritual than they are. You are there because God put you there. He called you there, and he wants you to do a job. Because we think we are more spiritual than anyone else as preachers, we often get ourselves in trouble. There may be someone in your church that is more spiritual than you are and can offer you some sound spiritual advice and thereby save you a lot of heartaches and troubles. Listen to them. Don't shut them off just because they came up with the idea instead of you. If you shut up your ears to their ideas, you may not have a church for very long. People will not respect you. Even someone that is not very spiritual is going to come up with some good ideas every once in a while. Maybe they can see something clearer than you can see it. You need to listen to what others have to say and be honest enough to evaluate it. If you are going into the ministry because you want to be spiritual and you think the best way to be spiritual is to be a preacher, then you have missed it. God did not call you. Some of the most ungodly people I have ever met have been preachers. How can that be? They have gotten so familiar with the word of God they become unspiritual. I didn't mean they study it a lot, but they have a few passages that they know, and they have a few messages down good. They can preach at the drop of a hat. They get so used to seeing people walk the aisles and seeing God do things until before long, they lose their walk with God and they get away from him. It is not easy to be spiritual in the ministry. In fact, you will find your hardest battle is going to be staying spiritual. You have to spend time in the word of God. This will be harder for you than it is for the average Christian because you are familiar with it. Things that are familiar often lose their freshness. If you eat oranges every day, there will come a day when you won't enjoy an orange as much as you used to. If you feast on the word of God every day, there may come a time when you think you have enough material to last for a long time. So you just start preaching by root. You are familiar with the things of the church, the service, and how things run, and everything gets into a rut. You get so familiar with it that the things of God don't touch your heart. This is one thing you have got to be very careful of. An inadequate view of the breadth of the qualifications of the ministry. Someone says, I love people. Doesn't that mean I ought to be a preacher? I love truth. Doesn't that mean I ought to be a preacher? I love to lead people to Christ. I get so excited when someone gets saved. Doesn't that mean I ought to be a preacher? I love the scriptures and understand them. Doesn't that mean that I ought to be a preacher? No, no. No, when a man gets saved, there ought to be a love for truth. He ought to understand the scriptures and to win the loss to Christ. But that doesn't mean that he ought to be a preacher. A lot of people have mistaken the desire to win the loss to Christ as a call to preach, and that is a big mistake. There is a definite call from God for a preacher. There will be a certain amount of these things, loving people, loving truth, desiring to see people saved, etc., that are in every person's life after salvation. But that does not make him a preacher. Someone might say, I like to go out and knock doors and I love to win people to Christ. I think I will get in the ministry so that I can go full-time knocking doors. They are going to be sadly disappointed when they get in the ministry because they are not going to have time to knock doors every day. When you first start a church and don't have a whole lot of people or a lot of administration work to do, you can knock doors about every day. But when the church starts getting a little larger, you are not going to have time to knock doors every day. You have got to take care of your people. You have got to be a shepherd too, and believe me, the sheep have many needs that need to be met. Who is supposed to reproduce in the church anyway? If you go out to a flock of sheep, you will see that it is the sheep that reproduce. Did you ever see a shepherd reproduce sheep? No, certainly not. We as preachers need to realize, though, that we are sheep too. We are still a child of God and need to win people to the Lord too. But contrary to public opinion, your greatest soul-winning activity will not be from you knocking on doors. Your greatest area of reproducing will be when your people in your church bring in friends and visitors. Then as you stand and preach the word, those people see the truth and come to get saved. That is going to be your greatest area of seeing people saved, and that is how a church grows best. 
I believe there ought to be door knocking. That is a good advertising. But you will not grow a church by door knocking alone. Your best growth will come as people get saved and they bring others. Who bring others? Who bring others? Etc. They get excited about what is going on. But how can they get excited if the man in the pulpit is not excited? And the man at the pulpit cannot be excited if he is not right with God. The preacher has a big responsibility here. If we are not careful, we will have an inadequate view of what qualifications are necessary for the ministry. A lot of people think they are qualified, but they are not. A lot of first-year students in college would like to take a church for a thousand and be the pastor. They mistakenly think they could handle it, but six months later, they would be out of the ministry. They are not ready, even though they think they have all the answers. When I was teaching in Bible college in Illinois, a young man visited the school one day. He had not been saved very long. He visited a few classes, and at the end of the day, he said, I don't think I need to go to school here or anywhere. I get so much more out of my Bible by myself than I would going to school. Besides, I already know all the stuff that you are teaching in school. I guess I don't need to go to school. Now, I don't doubt that he had a good grasp of the scriptures, but he did not understand the qualifications that are necessary for the ministry. He had some growing to do in his personal life that he did not see. You are going to find a certain pattern in your Christian life when you first get saved. You will grow a lot. Then you will hit a plateau. Then you will take off again and grow. Then you will hit another plateau. When you hit those plateaus, you may think, what is the matter with me? I must be black slidden. I am not excited as I used to be. Nothing is the matter with you. This is normal in a Christian's life. God taught you all those first truths by excitement. You grasped them because you were ready for them. God allowed you to get excited and really grow. Then God said, that is enough, and held off for a little while. He did that so that you would sit on the plateau and take those truths that he has already given you, work them into your heart, and apply them in your life. Then God lets you take off again and learn a few more things. Then he put you back on the plateau to digest them. You will find that your Christian life is like that over and over again. That is the way God grows you. So don't get alarmed when you hit a plateau. Just remember that God is teaching you and growing you. Did you ever watch a child grow physically? They follow basically the same pattern. At first, they grow fast. Then they stop growing for a while. They may stay the same size for several months. You will notice that they don't want as much to eat during these slow times. Then their appetite will pick up and they will start growing again. Children grow in spurts. That is the way it is with the Christian life also. An inadequate view of the qualifications of ministry will often put a man in the ministry when he ought not to be there. Prayerfully consider the qualifications and ask yourself if you meet them. A need for personal identity. The person who needs personal identity doesn't have a proper self-image. I compare it to the bully on the block. He thinks nobody likes him. So, since nobody likes him, like he is, he becomes a bully to get attention. He thinks if I act like a bully and get them all scared of me, then they will recognize me. He has some psychological needs that are not met. He is not happy with himself. There are a lot of physical misfits in the ministry. Then, say, they say they want to help other people, but they really want is help for themselves. They have a real problem. They are not happy with who they are. They want to be respected by other people. They want to be in a position where everybody loves them. But at the same time, they don't want people to look inside of them and see who they really are. They want to isolate themselves from others. The man who has a need for personal identity will reason something like this. The preacher doesn't live in the world or doesn't work in the world. He is away from people. The only time people see him is when he is preaching, and everyone thinks he is a great spiritual giant. So, if I was a preacher, I could get away from the world and wouldn't have to be around others. Then I could really live for God. Let me just warn you, that is the wrong reason to get into the ministry. A lot of preachers don't want to be transparent. They want to hide themselves from others and don't want anybody to know them. They want to be secretive and hide in their office. They think if they are seen only in the public, in the pulpit, then they won't have to get close to anyone. This type of man will not make a good preacher. A preacher ought to be the most transparent person in the church. People ought to be able to see what makes him tick. That is a real and genuine, and not just putting on a show. The man with unmet psychological needs needs to realize that he is somebody important to God. When he gets to where he likes himself, other people will like him too. When you like yourself and realize that God has made you for a purpose, two things will happen to you. First of all, some people will like you and you will enjoy it. Second, some people will not like you and you will not care. 
A preacher who is motivated by the action and reaction of other people will not be able to preach right. He will not be able to stand for the truth. A preacher has to come to the place where he is ready to say, this is the truth. I don't care if they like it or not. I have got to preach the truth. I am not going to intentionally hurt their feelings, and I will try to be tactful. But I must preach the truth. If people dislike it, that is too bad. I have to preach the truth. That is very hard for many preachers to do, but it is the stand he must have if he is going to be true to the word of God. Too many preachers desire to be liked. They like to get in the pulpit ministry, so people will like them. You are going to find out quickly that will not be the case if you stand for the truth. There will be many people who will not like you. However, if a man is true to the Bible, there are many who will love him and follow him. Also, a man of God must determine that when he preaches, he needs to just be plain himself. If other preachers don't like that, that is their problem. God didn't call you to be like them. He called you to be yourself. This is something you have to get settled early in your ministry, and sometimes it is a hard one to handle. The easiest thing to do at a meeting is preach like you think others want you to preach, and to say what they want you to say instead of what God wants you to say. God doesn't intend for a preacher to be like that. He wants a man to stand up with his book and preach like he made him to preach. If God wants you to turn somersaults when you preach, then turn somersaults. If God wants you to stand behind the pulpit and talk quietly, go right ahead and do it. But be sure you have the power of God on your preaching, whatever you do. Unsanctified ambition of others. <laughs> Unsanctified ambition of others will often put a man in the ministry. They say, Mama wants me to be a preacher. Ever since I was a little kid, she kept telling me I was going to be a preacher. Or maybe it was daddy or some other preacher. God doesn't call that way. Just because your preacher called you to be a preacher doesn't mean God did. Your preacher may be able to see something in you that would indicate God is calling you, but you need to hear it from God. There have been a couple of men in my ministry who I knew God was going to call. I knew it before they did, but I didn't tell them. I let God do that. If a man walks down the aisle and says, God has called me to preach, I always tell them to give it a little time to be sure. If God is for sure calling them, it will last. A little while back, I talked to a young man who has been given some sound advice. When he approached his preacher and told him that he thought God was calling him to preach, his preacher told him, wait a year and then I will talk to you. A year later, the preacher talked to him and helped him find a school and start getting prepared. That was good, sound advice. If the desire to preach wore off in a year, the man was not called. A lot of men walk down the aisle and the preacher announces that Johnny has been called to preach. Everyone shouts and says, isn't that great? Billy walks down the aisle and says God wants him to be a farmer and the preacher says, Oh, that is good. Have a seat. But if God called Billy to be a farmer, he wouldn't be any good as a preacher. But as a farmer doing what God called him to do, he is the best place for him to be. The unsanctified ambitions of others will often put a man in the ministry when he shouldn't be. An over-suggestion will work the same way. Constantly suggesting to someone that they are called to preach will often put that thought in their head. You need to be very careful in your ministry and in your life. This is especially true with children. They are easily persuaded and grow up with the wrong idea about what God wants for their life. Let God call them. You don't need to put the idea in their head. You need to examine yourself and say, Am I called to preach or did someone just put that off on me? Am I called by God or by someone else? That is an area in which you need to be careful. Chapter 3. The Four Indispensable Elements of a Call all four of these elements are involved to some degree in the call to a ministry. Some of them will be stronger in one man than another. Also, all of these areas should grow as we go on in our Christian life and ministry. But all four of them should be present in a man's life. A desire to preach that comes from a right motive. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desires the good work. 1 Timothy 3.1 Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly. Not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. 1 Peter 5.2 A preacher should have a desire to preach that comes from a right motive. He should willingly take the leadership position. It is wrong to want to preach. No. To want to be in a pulpit? To want to pastor a church? No. There is nothing wrong with that desire. If it comes from the right kind of motive. That is what you have to evaluate. The right motive is born out of three things. A considered desire. First, there ought to be a considered desire. By what 
I mean, you should honestly consider all the facets of the ministry. Your desire should be born out of that. It ought not to be primrose look or a look through rose-colored glasses. It ought not to be a look that considers only the glory or the prestige involved. You should see the ministry for what it really is. Many see the ministry as the preacher standing in the pulpit three hours a week and maybe a little door knocking, and that is all. They see the people patting him on the back and saying, Preacher, I really like that sermon. But that is not all there is in the ministry. That is, in fact, a very small amount of the ministry. There are a great deal of other things you will be doing as you will find. You may be running off bulletins, typing stencils, washing floors, setting up chairs, taking down chairs, cleaning the toilets in the bathroom, sweeping the carpet. You may be going around picking up people or taking them home. You are going to be dealing with people who are mad at you or someone else in the church, and you have to smooth out the mess. There are all kinds of facets to the ministry, so there needs to be a right look at the ministry, a considered desire, a constraining desire. Second, this right motive is born out of a constraining desire. By that I mean it ought to be something that compels you. It ought to not be something that comes and goes. It ought to be something that continually grows. Anything from God will grow as you examine it. For example, if God is leading me to start a church in a particular town, that desire and burden for that town will grow. I will get more and more of a desire and burden for that town as I gather information and as time goes on. <clears throat> if that burden shoots up and I get excited about it today, and then tomorrow it goes down and stays down, then maybe something happens a week later and all of a sudden I am interested again, and then I am not interested for a month or two longer, then all of a sudden I am excited and interested in again. I know that is not of God. That is not how God deals. A considered desire and a constraining desire go together. As you consider it, it becomes more and more constraining. It would be harder for me to quit the ministry now than it would have been when I was first called. It would be easier the first four or five years in ministry to quit and go get a secular job than it would be now. The longer you are in the ministry, the more your heart desires the ministry. You desire to be in the ministry and to do what God wants you to do. I am not saying I could have quit when I first started out. I maybe could have quit physically, but I would not have been happy very long. God would have made me miserable, but it would have been easier to have just turned my back because of hardship and tried to quit then than it would be now. The more I walk with the Lord, the more my ministry goes on, the more the burden and the desire to be in the ministry grows. A disinterested desire. Third, this motive is born out of a disinterested desire. It needs to be free from all personal gains. Why do you want to become a preacher? Is it so that you can make more money or have lots of friends or so you can be important or be noticed? These are wrong reasons. You ought to want to be a preacher and a pastor more than anything else in the world, no matter what it may cost you. Here is the key. If it is a disinterested desire, it will be a desire that will carry you out no matter what happens. Whether the church pays you or not will not matter to you. You will be willing to preach and pastor anyway and go on just as if they were paying you. There have been several times in churches that I have pastored that I did not get a paycheck at all for a period of time. What happened? Did I quit or leave? No, that is what a hireling would do, not the shepherd. The shepherd goes on working and doesn't let it bother him. He just keeps on working for God, whether the crowds are big or small. If the desire is right, then you will go on working for God, whether you are in an important church or an unimportant church in the eyes of men. The most important thing that you have to decide is this. Do you have the desire to preach? Is it a burning desire? I don't mean, is it just something that passes, but is it a burning desire? Are you willing to serve God no matter where you go, no matter what it takes, even if that means nobody notices you for years? If the answer is yes, then you are well on your way to finding out if you are called. If you answer no, then you are not called to God. Graces that indicate a genuine, mature Christian experience. The second element of the call to preach involves a mature, balanced Christian life. One of the reasons men think they are called when they are not is because they have an inadequate view of the needs and qualifications of the ministry. You need to seriously consider the qualifications for a preacher that are listed in 1 Timothy chapter 3. A bishop must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, nor covetous, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? 
not a novice, lest, being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. 1 Timothy 3, 2-7 Let's consider some of these qualifications. Blameless means, when others look at you, they don't find anything they can bring a charge against you with. Nothing that is out of place in your life. Vigilant means watchful in all things. Sober is talking about mature thinking. Good behavior means behaving in a right way all the time, not just when you feel like it. Given to hospitality means willing to open your house up to others. How hospitable are you? Are you hospitable enough to say, you need a place to live? Why don't you come to my house and live with us for a while? Now, I like people to come and visit and to have fellowship with them, but I also enjoy it when they go home. Then I can kick off my shoes and just lay back and take it easy. Apt to teach speaks of the ability to be able to lay out the word of God in an understandable way. I ask you, when do you ever arrive at the place where you are a good teacher? Consider these things and see how you line up. The next time he lists is not given to wine. He could have just as easily said in there, not given to anything. In other words, nothing that hold on to your life. Coffee, Coke, Pepsi, burritos, ice cream, etc. If you are given to something, you are controlled by it. Next on the list is no striker. This is not just talking about doubling up your fists and letting someone really have it. It is also talking about the anger in your heart that would cause you to do such a thing. A man of God should not be known as someone who looks for a good fight. Not greedy of filthy lucre speaks of having the right attitude about money. We can stand and preach all we want to about how we ought to not be loving riches, but when our bank account runs short, what do we do? We worry. Lord, what am I going to do if this money does not come in? I have got to find me a job. I need some promise of income somewhere. Isn't that being greedy of a certain extent? We need to be sure that we are not serving the Lord for money. Next, he lists patience. Who among us all has the patience that we need? Have you ever been running late somewhere? Are you patient when you come up behind that car that is going slow? Did you ever sit at a stoplight when someone in front of you doesn't move when the light changes? What do you say? Why doesn't she hurry up? Good grief. Why don't they get off the road if they don't want to drive? We need to cultivate a patient spirit and learn to rest in the Lord. We have already seen that the man of God is not to be known as a striker, but he also says that he is not a brawler. I think it is interesting that he should mention this twice. Maybe it is because this is an area we need to be very careful in, that we do let our flesh run our lives. Do you enjoy a fight? just to get in there and let them have it. If there is anything in you at all, you will feel like that sometimes. But does that dominate your life? Not covetous. Another area we need to watch out for. Maybe you think, oh, if I would not have gone into the ministry, I would be rich today. I could have been working in the greatest jewelry stores in America, and I would be one of the finest gem setters you have ever seen. I could be making thousands of dollars a week. Where does that come from? Covetousness. How come that preacher over there makes so much more money than I do? How come I have people in my church who make more money than I do? You need to beware of covetousness. One that ruleth well his own house. That is a rough one. You say, well, my wife doesn't run the house. Fine, but it is talking about more than just that. It isn't talking about being in charge, but ruling well. A ruler is not a tyrant. Do you ever act like a tyrant around your home? Where is my food? Why are you so slow? Don't you know what we have to be going? What is the matter with you, woman? You may not say these things like that, but something similar. The way a man of God rules his own home will also determine how he rules his church. Your home will also be an example to those in your church. Oh, how important it is to be the right kind of an example here. Not a novice. That is a rough one also. When do you graduate from novice up to responsible and ready? Where do you draw the line? I well remember my experience with this. God called me to preach in 1972. A year later, I started preaching in Lake Ministry in Southern Missouri. I was not pastoring anybody, but I wasn't ready yet. Later that year, I was called to my first church, but I was still a novice. As I look back now, I feel sorry for those people in that church. It was a small church, but I preached hard. They just had Sunday morning services when I went there, so we started Sunday evening services. For a whole year, I preached every service on soul winning. I was mean. I raked them over the coals, but we did not have one person saved the whole year. 
You talk about a humbling experience. Here I was preaching on soul winning. I was out knocking doors three to four times a week. I couldn't win one person to the Lord. That hurt badly. I could go off to other people's churches and preach, and people would get saved. I would go soul winning in Springfield, Missouri, and win people to the Lord there. But when I got out to my church to try to win someone to Christ, no one would get saved. God just shut it down. He was teaching me things. I was a novice. I learned about the need to love my people there at that church. I learned it the hard way. I left that church after I had been there a year and went to another church running about 60. During the nine months I was there, we had 60 people make professions. You see, God had taught me how to love my people instead of beating them all the time. Some preachers are great beaters. They can just clobber and clobber, but people can only take so much clobbering and then they quit. I was a novice and God had to teach me some things. If you get too proud, you are in trouble. Every young man must deal with this. A good report of them which are without. Where do you stand? Is everybody outside your church talking about you in a bad way? They may not agree with you, but they should be able to say that guy is an honest man. I don't like what he says and the way he talks about being saved, but he is an honest man. He won't lie to you. He won't cheat you. That ought to be your report. When we boil it all down, what does it mean? When a person looks at your life, they ought to see a balanced Christian life. There ought to be some graces in your life that indicate that God has called you to preach. Some graces that indicated that you have grown as a Christian. When I look back at my life, I must say that I should never have been ordained in 1975 when I was. I had been preaching for two years, but I wasn't ready to be pastoring a church. I did not deserve it. If I were sitting on my ordination council, looking back now, I would have voted me down. I would have said, no way. When I sit on an ordination council now, I am a lot harder on guys than they were on me. I have read the Bible a little more and know the qualifications better. In fact, to be honest with you, there are very few men in the ministry I could lay my hands on. God has laid out some very stringent requirements, some that are hard to be received. We need to examine ourselves. There needs to be a balance of patience and zeal in a preacher. You need patience to be able to take things in stride and not get all upset and out of shape. You need to just go on whether things are good or bad. There needs to be enough zeal so that you don't just sit back and die when things aren't going well. But be careful that you aren't overbalanced on either side. Some men are so patient they don't get up and do anything. Others are so zealous they have no patience to wait on God. There needs to be a balance between the two. There also needs to be a balance in self-discipline. A preacher needs to be harder on himself than he is on the people. But at the same time, with the self-discipline, there needs to be a balance of love for the people. Why should not constantly be browbeating them, but loving them too? I have found I can get people to do more for me if they know I love them than if I just hit them over the head. There is a balance here that the preacher needs to realize in his ministry and in his life. We can't be overly harsh and constantly beat their people and then end up running them off. That is not good preaching. When you go into another man's church, you are better off to love those people for a while and get them to loving you before you even start skinning them out. People think an evangelist should come in and just rip and snort and tear the people up. No, when he tears the people up, they don't listen. They turn around and go the other way. The preachers who have learned how to preach hard have learned first how to come into a church and get those people to love them. When the people love them after the first service or two, they can turn around and preach hard. They have two things going for them. First of all, their repu reputation preceding them. The people already love them because everyone has heard of them before. They are all ready to listen to hard preaching because they have heard all about him. But if you or I walk in there, they don't know us. To the average Christian, you are a nobody. They have not heard of you and are not interested in you. If you get in there and beat them, you have lost them. You have learned to love them first and then get them loving you. There has to be a balance. So the graces need to be there in a preacher. The desire to be holy must be stronger than the desire to preach. You look at these qualifications in 1 Timothy and you must agree that they are rough. But you ought to have more of a desire to fulfill those qualifications than what you do to even stand in the pulpit. You ought to have a stronger desire to live for God and be holy and be what God wants you to be than you have a desire to stand in the pulpit. When a preacher goes wrong, this is where he fails. He loves preaching, but his desire to be holy is lost. You take a man who runs off with his secretary. What happened to him? He lost his desire to be holy, but he continued in the pulpit ministry, preaching to his people while he was running around in sin. 
The preacher who is a thief goes wrong in the same way. I know of a preacher pastoring a church who stole mission money from the church to pay his wife's doctor bills. What went wrong? He lost his desire to be holy and yet stayed in the pulpit. Gentlemen, your desire to be holy ought to be stronger than your desire to preach. Only you can know if it isn't. How much do you want to be holy? As a preacher, you ought to be working at growing spiritually. You shouldn't just be marking time and thinking of your day of softness and greatness. A lot of men are like that. They think, one of these days I'm going to be great. I am just going to take it a step at a time, this church, to this church, to this church, and so on. I am going to be another R.G. Lee. A lot of men have their careers all planned out, and they are just marking time. They want to become one of the greats. They have missed it. A lot of preachers go to school for only one reason, so they can get the paper to hang on the wall to prove that they are somebody great. What is that? Vanity, emptiness, uselessness. They are marking time. They are not right. They are not ready to preach. They need to grow spiritually. You ought to spend more time growing your personal life than you spend trying to get a big name so you can get a big church. I am not saying you have to be perfect, but you should have a desire to be holy. If you do not have a desire to be holy, then you probably have a desire to be great, to be somebody. Let me just say that nobody can meet all the qualifications in 1 Timothy chapter 3 completely. If you would line up the greatest preachers in America, you would find that they don't match up completely. But here is the key. Those great men look at the qualifications. They admit their inadequacies, and they say, God help me to improve. They have more of a desire to meet those qualifications than anything else. When they are put into a position of greatness, of respect, where others look at them, they say, how did this happen to me? If a man says, well, I finally arrived. It is about time I got here. He has just told you he is not where he belongs spiritually. He may not even be called. Holiness is not something you arrive at instantly. It is something you are always shooting for, something you are always growing into. So you need to seriously consider it. Do you desire to be holy more than you desire to preach? Gifts that indicate God has supplied all your need. The third element that should be seen in a man if God has called him to preach are certain gifts or areas in his life that indicate that God has called him. There are three types of gifts or three areas that we consider. Spiritual understanding. This is the wisdom of God to see through a problem. In other words, you may know a preacher who has very low IQ, but he has great spiritual discernment. Intellectually, he is not the smartest man who walked the face of the earth, but he can sit down and talk to you. And as you start talking, he can see right through you. He can see every problem that you have, where you are at, and as you talk, he can analyze you. That is God giving him wisdom. Every preacher has that ability to a certain extent. If God has called you, he has given you a spiritual understanding that the average person does not have. As you talk to people and visit with them, you can discern exactly where they stand. You will be able to discern whether they are being truthful and honest or are trying to hide things from you. The longer you are in the ministry and exercise that spiritual wisdom, the more it will grow. But if God has called you, there will be a certain degree of that wisdom in you already. If God has not given you that spiritual wisdom, then you are not God's man. You are not called. You may have a high IQ, but that is not what I am talking about. I am talking about spiritual understanding. This is the most important thing you can have. You can do more than any psychologist can do if you are called of God and you know the book. Intellectual gift. Second, you must have a certain amount of intellectual gift. In other words, a reasonable amount of brain power. Now, I recognize that not all preachers are super brains. You don't have to be super smart, but you need to be able to spend some time mentally studying God's word and getting to know it. You should be able to understand the Old Testament and the New Testament and how the different books of the Bible relate to each other. You need to have a grasp on the word of God. If you have certain amount of intellectual ability, you ought to be able to get that grasp on the word of God. But if you can't, you don't belong in the ministry. The most important thing you will ever do is spend time in the word of God so you will know it well enough to preach it and teach it. If you don't have the mental ability to do that, how are you ever going to be able to teach it to anybody else? Evidence of the gift of preaching. Third, you need evidence in your life that you have the gift of preaching. In other words, you ought to be an apt preacher and teacher. When you preach, people ought to get something out of it. It ought not to be just rambling. If all you do is ramble, there is something wrong. When God calls a man, he gives him the ability to preach and to teach. I did not get my ability to teach and preach from any school. I got those abilities from God. 
When I was called to preach, I was not a public speaker. I could not stand in front of a group and speak. It was very hard for me. I was not a teacher, but God called me to preach, and he has given me a certain gift of teaching ability that I can teach and get things across. Every preacher is not as good a teacher as another preacher, but he has a certain degree of being able to teach. If you can't preach and teach and get things across, there is something wrong with your call. God has not equipped you. Opportunity to minister. Not only must you have a desire to preach and be growing as a Christian, not only must you have certain gifts that indicate that God has called you, but you must also have the opportunity to preach and minister. The man who says, I have been called to preach, but I just can't get anywhere to preach, is in sad shape. Something is not right in his life. I have never lacked opportunities to preach. They have always been readily available. If God has called you, he will open the doors. You don't have to knock them down. If God doesn't open the doors, then God didn't call you, or you are not ready yet. God opens the doors. When the doors are left closed, there is a reason for it. These men who can't get a church for a year and nothing seems to work out had better sit back and make a good examination of themselves. They need to ask, am I where God really wants me to be, doing what he wants me to do? Has God called me? If he has called you, then he will provide a place for you when he is ready, in his time, not yours. If you will just wait, God will give you the right time and place, and you will take off and be blessed. If you put yourself in the wrong place at the wrong time, you are going to find everything backfiring in your face. Nothing will be right. I am not saying when you get to where God wants you, everything will be rosy. You will have problems, but you will have peace in those problems. You will know that God has opened the door and given you a job to do, and you can't wait to get it. Conclusion. Gentlemen, I urge you to carefully examine your call. If God has called you, then you can't help but preach. If you can keep from preaching, then God didn't call you. You better go find something else to do. But my advice to you, if God has called you, preach. This has been A Call to the Ministry by Douglas Hammett, read by Benjamin Decker.